This week on Case Studies with the BizDoc, it's Grubhub. You get home at six o'clock, there's nothing in the fridge, you don't feel like going out or the weather is bad, that's who you call. And you're not alone. 450,000 people a day are calling Grubhub. And it's a company that the market seems to think is worth $9 billion. But I'm gonna tell you what I think. I'm gonna take you through three parts of the Grubhub story. First, the founders, where did they come from? Where'd they get the idea and raising early venture capital? Part two, their growth strategy, including Rollup, which was the key to where they are today. And lastly, what I think the future has in store for Grubhub. Let's dive in. So you have Matt Maloney and Mike Evans. They're developers and they were working for apartments.com. Smart guys. They were working on geolocation. What geolocation is, is wherever you are and you look on your app, you look online, it senses where you are and gives you choices around there to make it more efficient for you to use a particular app or a service product. And they looked at that and they said, wow, could this technology be adapted for food? We're developers, we work late, we get home hungry. It's a pain in the neck to call a restaurant, give them your credit card, ask them what's on the menu, and they noticed that when they went to restaurant websites, they were really terrible. Who knew the restaurant website was there? A restaurant is born, they make a website, but they don't advertise it, it's word of mouth. But if there's word of mouth and you know about the restaurant, you just go there or you call them. And they said, wow, what if we could make this easier and people would actually be able to find a selection of restaurants order what they want, and maybe we could arrange all that. The birth of Grubhub. There they are, 0506, and they did it with fax. This is a archaic machine where you put a piece of paper in here and you call somebody and then a piece of paper comes out the other end. For those of you that were born after 1995, you can find them in the Smithsonian. Their early growth was in Chicago. They knew the neighborhoods, they knew the restaurants. They went door to door and started asking them, say, hey, we could do this for you, we could do that for you, you could get more results than what you're getting on your website. And people said, no, 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 I've already spent a lot of money on my website. I'm not getting out of it. I'm not going to spend anything with you. And then they had a thought and they came back and they said, well, what if you gave me 10% of extra meals that I can get people to buy from you. And the restaurant said, that's fine, I'll do it that way. You give me more meals, I get more revenue, I'll give you 10%. And the Grubhub business model was born. They went to Chicago, they expanded to a whole lot of restaurants, and as you're growing, what do you need? Venture capital. So here they were in 2007, and as the CEO, Matt Maloney, tells it, it takes a long time to raise venture capital. He's absolutely right. Venture capitalists never say no. They say, we'll get back to you, we'll see what we think. Every now and then you may get a hard no from one of them, but most of the time it's an elongated process and you really don't have firm answers. And he was very frustrated by that. So he said, you know what? We just have to bootstrap it and do it ourselves. And that's what they did. And then they did a little piece of guerrilla marketing. They said, why don't we make our next market San Francisco? There's a lot of investors out there, venture capitalists out there. So they went out there, started advertising and did some things. And guess who noticed? The venture capitalists. Grubhub. Isn't that those guys? guys from Chicago that came to us with that idea about, you know, faxing in things to the restaurant, making more money for the restaurant, raising awareness. Yeah, maybe we should talk to them again. And in 2007, they raised a $1.1 million Series A, taking little bits of money, keeping control, and keeping ownership of the company. I think that was smart. That was followed by more growth, and then a couple years later, 2009, they raised $2 million of venture capital in the B round. A, B, just the letters that signify the order of the tranches of money that you raise. Then came something very, very big, and that was in 2010, they got the attention of Benchmark Capital, one of the top two or three venture venture capitalist firms in the world. And they raised $11 million. Now they were off and running. About that same time in 2010, they introduced their mobile app. Although that says Moby, so now we'll all pretend we're from Australia. I got my Moby with me. They moved forward in 2011 and they raised another 20 million. And what this really shows you is traction. The traction was here expanding city to city and they had really perfected the business model. Their main group and their main management team was in Chicago, but now they were putting people in each city who understood the demographics and what's hot, what's not of the local restaurant scene. At the same time, they also came to a conclusion. We don't have high barriers to entry. What's a barrier to entry? Those are things about your business that make it hard for somebody else to copy it or jump into the same market and open a business of their own. This, 
very low barriers to entry. We could make a mobile app, go talk to restaurants in our own city, as many other companies were already doing, and we can be off and running. So they looked at it and said, this is gonna be all about scale. What's scale? Scale is assimilating things the same way Amazon did. So as you grow big, you are actually have lower cost in things because you're replicating all the services or cost of your business over a larger revenue base. And that's called scaling the business. As they looked at scaling being successful, they set aside their ego about Grubhub, the only way to do it, and said, now wait a minute, maybe we should be acquiring some of these other companies that are similar to us, we'll achieve scale. Let's be selective and careful about what we do and careful about how we spend the investor's money, but that's the way they did it. Along comes the Pac-Man phase. In 2011, they had raised that $20 million in the Series D I mentioned. Then, late 2011, they raised $50 million in a Series E. Those are big dollars. How were they able to do that? Well, in 2011, they actually had $60 million in revenue. That's their share of the revenue of what they get. So that was probably four, $500 million of the meals that they were facilitating, but that was their cut. By the end of 2012, they got that up to 82 million. So right here, you see the investment community saying, wow, you guys are on a roll, you guys are hot. We're putting in real money. Then comes this phase. Now let's take a look at what happened. I got friendly Pac-Man here and I got a bunch of dots because over time they would buy all menus, Seamless. Those of you in the Northeast United States know who Seamless is. Well, guess what? Today, it's a division of Grubhub, all under the same family. They also bought Delivered Dish, Restaurants on the Run, and LA Bite they would buy in 2016 for $65 million. Now everybody in LA on the other side knows what LA Bite is and there are thousands of restaurants restaurants already connected to LA Byte. So Grubhub, if they said, we're gonna get people and money and we're gonna invade LA and we're gonna take the turf. No, that would have taken too much time. They bought the turf. As long as the price of what you're buying is reasonable and you get the payoff. And it's early enough that the LA Byte people say, well, let's take $65 million and we'll become part of Grubhub. And they don't change the name to Grubhub. Why? Because people in LA know who LA Byte is, just like everybody in New York and New Jersey know exactly who Seamless is. That led to 17 on this Pac-Man <laughs> path here, where they bought Eat24 for $287 million. That's a big stack of money, but guess what? Eat24 was actually owned by Yelp. And Yelp, two years prior, had actually bought this for a little over $130 million. So Yelp sells it for 286 Seven, makes a little bit of profit and a technology handshake was made where Grubhub will use the Yelp technology for identifying, making restaurant reviews. So suddenly now they have a feeder system through the relationship with Yelp to go with what they're building in a nationwide roll up. Why is that important? Now you've got something that helps differentiate them. And if you're like me, I'm always yelping my favorite restaurant reviews and ones that are not so favorite that I don't go back again. And restaurants are starting to take notice. Any of you who use Yelp know that if you put a particularly bad review, as long as you're being tasteful and polite about your review and say, hey, this didn't work for me, this wasn't so good, restaurants are actively trying to come back and say, listen, we're really sorry about that. I'd like to take care of you on your next visit. Because they can tell people that are just you know, flaming them versus people that are given an honest review. Nonetheless, Yelp technology through a handshake agreement as part of the Eat24 acquisition is now inside Grubhub as an important differentiation point. So that in summary is a roll-up strategy. Buying things that are like you as long as the price is right that helps you get bigger or expand your footprint. This is a footprint play. Now let's step back and see what the revenue line looked like and how they ultimately went public. When I left off, they were at $82 million here. Well, the following year, $137 million, and they made $6 million of net income. Then $253 million in 2014, and that was their IPO. That's when they went public. And since going public, their stock has been on a progressive tear. There was a little dip and a spook that happened between now and then, but it recovered quickly and it's moved forward. How have they delivered for people who have invested? Well, in 2015, they went from a little over a quarter billion to 361 in top line sales. Then $38 million. That's a little more than 10%, the net income compared to the revenue. 2016, 493 and 49, sitting right about there at about 10%. And then 2017, $683 million in revenue and $98 million in net income. 
And in 2017, around August, a report came out and it said they were number one in nine cities. Now, what did that do? That really painted a picture for everybody. It says, wait, after all of this roll up and all this success, they look like they're doing good. The revenue looks like they're doing good and they are doing good. You're telling me they're number one in only nine US cities? Yes, and that's adding all of this up, which shows you how low those barriers are entry and this is not the last time they're gonna be making acquisitions. Nonetheless, they had 8.8 .8 million total unique active visitors, you know, over the course of a quarter or a year as they measure that, and 324,000 daily average grubs, called a DAG. That's the average number of meals per day that are ordered through their service through all the brands that comprise Grubhub. And now Grubhub is more of a parent company with brands underneath putting its culture and technology and philosophies through everything. Then we have here 900 million in gross food sales. In other words, that's the ticket. That's the bill that the customer paid, not their part. So in other words, they're now causing restaurants across the United States, not from sit down diners, but from the people that are taking out through the Grubhub services and all the brands, $900 million of restaurant revenue was caused by Grubhub because you and me got home, the weather was bad, there's nothing in the fridge, we call Grubhub. 2018 Q1, this just shows what a role they're on. After the Eat24 acquisition and the Yelp integration, which happened at the end of 17, Q1, $232 million and $30 million of net income. When you put that together, where's my producer? What is that per year? 920 million. $920 million. So now they've created a company that's generating over $1.2 billion in gross food sales to all the nation's restaurants. So in other words, this is working for restaurants, it's working for Grubhub, and you know it's working for you and me. And they're up to 436,000 daily average grubs, and they have 15 million active members. So with all those stats, what's this company worth? Well, now we're gonna to get to something I wanna dive into a little bit. Grubhub, it's about 105 to 107 right now on the stock market. That's the price per share, early June 2018 as we film this. That translates to a valuation of $9 billion. So if you wanted to buy all the stock of Grubhub and own Grubhub yourself, you need a dump truck full of $9 billion with you to pull that off. What we do on the stock market is we have what's called the PE ratio. It's a way you can, can compare different companies to each other. You look at the price of their stock compared to the earnings of the company. Think of it as a temperature. You take the temperature of five people, doesn't matter how tall, how short, or what they weigh, the temperature can be compared. That's really a way to compare companies. Their PE right now is 85. I think that's kind of high. The PE, I think, would be much lower for what they're doing, a service business where other people can easily compete with you by opening up shop, getting a mobile app, and a collection of restaurants in some local city where they know the playing field. So at 85, I think that's a little rich. Let's compare it to some companies that we know. Google, PE of 47. Apple, PE of 18. Now let's go to the pure internet side because Google is definitely a multi-division ad company and Android company, very, very mature. Apple, we know what they are. You go to Amazon and Netflix, internet-based, internet growth companies. Amazon's at 212 and Netflix is 242. Now everyone is saying about Amazon, they've been saying for years, oh my gosh, Amazon's PE is too high, but they keep going up and prove that they can live with that PE, Netflix at 242. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, it means their price is pretty high for what they're delivering, but they keep growing and driving. So you'll watch over time as they do what's called growing into their PE. What does that mean? Well, that means the stock may be flat for a little season or two, even as they grow revenue. And what that really means is they're growing into their PE, because PE is usually forward. There's a lot of anticipation and future in the price of any stock. So what do I see in the future for Grubhub? Well, we had Pac-Man on this side, and we've got evil Pac-Man on this side. Uber Eats, Amazon, and DoorDash are three very significant competitors. I've pointed out that they're only number one in about nine to 12 cities right about now, which means that Amazon, DoorDash, and Uber Eats are number one in other cities. Amazon flat out owns Seattle and they've been experimenting with meal delivery. They deliver products, they do same day delivery of many things to your door. So what would keep Amazon from going out to a large set of restaurants and saying, hey, be part of the Amazon family. You know, I'll deliver for you the same way I deliver everything else. Barriers to entry low, brand recognition of Amazon high, big, big barrel of people like you and me and Amazon knows what we order and what we've been doing, a lot of customer data. 
data, it'd be very easy for them to move from Seattle and go to many other cities. Uber Eats, they already have fleets and fleets of drivers and reliable drivers is one of the things that the Grubhub guy said gave them a headache early on. Lastly, DoorDash, which is very, very similar to Grubhub. So nonetheless, you've got a lot of variability in the market share on cities. Let's take a look at some of those. Here in Dallas, Uber Eats has got like 30% market share. They're also number one in Houston, Fort Worth, and San Antonio. In Chicago, Grubhub's got like 60% market share. They're the home team. That's where they grew up. But you go out to some place like Charlotte, it's DoorDash with almost 30%. In Indianapolis, DoorDash is also number one. Philadelphia, Grubhub is number one. In Los Angeles, it's Postmates, something that hasn't been bought by anybody just yet, but probably will be. You go to Phoenix and Postmates is in a dead tie with Uber Eats. And then in Seattle, it's Amazon. Down in San Diego, it's DoorDash. I think there are several things I like to point out that the Grubhub team did very well. Number one, they were adaptable. They adapted to the market. Remember, they started with faxes and they didn't get their Moby technology until 2010. They also adapted to competition. They understood that it didn't have to be their brand. You know why they did that? No hubris. Hubris is being very cocky and arrogant. They didn't have hubris. They said, well, if we have to roll up and buy other people and other brands, let's do it if that's the right thing for the business. Very smart. They also weren't about NIH, which stands for not invented here. Anybody who is an engineer knows how that goes. We can make it. We can do it. We don't need to buy anything. Not invented here can be a killer because it takes you time to do things that maybe you should just buy. These guys were smart about hubris and not invented here. Number three, speed within strategy. Look how quickly they were raising money. Look how quickly they were making acquisitions. They knew that speed was everything and they executed on it. And lastly, they clearly know that this is about market share and scale. As these giants come into the picture and they're worth $9 billion with the market watching and asking them questions every quarter, they know exactly what they need to do. I happen to think Matt and Mike were very, very sharp about the way they went about it. So I think the future of food delivery for you and me is very bright and tremendous. And we are going to watch a war unfold. Will there be more acquisitions the way Grubhub grew themselves? Will Uber Eats go after DoorDash or Postmates or someone like that? Time will tell. But the wonderful thing is this business model has emerged and you and I have diversity of choice and a great opportunity in our busy lives to have technology and service come together. And the market seems to think that these businesses can be worth billions and billions of dollars. I think Grubhub's got a great chance to lead as all this comes together for you and me, the beneficiaries of these great service products. That's the Grubhub story and we're all gonna see what the future holds. What do you use when you're hungry? Leave me a comment below and tell me about your experience with Grubhub or DoorDash or any of the competitors and chime in if you don't think they're worth $9 billion or maybe you think they're worth more. You can also follow me, the BizDoc, on Instagram or on Facebook. I've come to the dark side and I finally have a Facebook business page. I'll see you next week with another case study. Remember, Valuetainment is on a mission to a million subscribers. And when we get there, it will be the first annual Valuetainment Entrepreneur Conference featuring Patrick Bet David, yours truly, the biz doc, and other leaders bringing you information to make yourself better, your business better, and the people around you that your business and you are touching better still. I'm Tom Elser with the biz doc, and I hope I left you better than I found you. Mm -hmm.